was almost like the world stopped. This huge roar started. I don't know what to do. Coming right up at us. My name is Glenn Barassa. I'm the assistant director for the state of Pennsylvania for the Pennsylvania Bigfoot Project. I've been with them about three years now. I've been interested in Bigfoot since the mid-70s when I first had my experiences out in Arizona in the White Mountains up there. So that's how I got started. Some pretty hair-raising experiences that uh, most people would be a little traumatized by, but I wasn't, and I actually um, got more interested and intrigued by them for many years since then. Well, you know, it seems like um, seeing a Bigfoot or having some form of an encounter has two impacts on people. One is they become obsessed with knowing what they saw and they go out there and really, really super duper research, try to recreate that. And the second one is they get afraid of the woods and they never go back again. But tell me about this first encounter that was so scary. Give me some details on that. Sure. Uh, before I do, I did want to say that I have forgave them for the frightening experience that I had back then because i don't think it was totally directed at me but i just want to let you know that that i forgave them for frightening me how this first one happened um i was at a birthday party with friends of mine it was about two o'clock in the morning and i was going to help my friend walk his girlfriend home so her and i left and we had to walk probably about a half an hour walk home through the high school through the woods down these you know dark roads we used to joke they'd roll up the sidewalks at night in this area. So it was way up in the mountains in Arizona. So we go by, by this down this one street. I walked her home. Second night, she went in through her window because that's what you kids do at 2.30 in the morning. We were like 15 years old. And I'm walking back down Woodland Lake Road. And the dogs at this one house, the last house on the left, started just raising hell. I mean, they were pretty vicious dogs they came right up to the fence before right up at us so i decided to kind of start walking across the street i got about halfway across the street and halfway past the house and the dogs went silent they didn't whine nothing just silent and you couldn't hear any other sound of any other animals any other cars nothing just total silence it was almost like the world stopped. It was weird. And I kept walking. As I got past the house, probably about 30 feet past the house, this huge roar started to my left up in the trees. Probably about 50 to 60 feet back from the road and about approximately 35, 40 feet up in the tree. And it was the loudest thing I'd ever heard other than a concert. I could feel the vibration going through my body like I was standing in front of a concert speaker. And I mean, right in front of it. The amount of vibration was intense. And I just kept walking. Something just told me not to run. And I know that you'd be prey if you run, so I didn't. I just kept walking. I had to go down about a 30-foot incline, and then it levels out again. And the trees end to my left. And it's a pretty big farmer field, a field out there. And I'm about halfway through that field on the road. There's a little barbed wire fence on both sides. And all of a sudden, I hear something to my left moving pretty quickly. And I'm like, okay, just keep walking, just keep walking. And there's more trees to the right and some summer cabins back then. And pretty soon, I hear it on my right side. I'm like, okay, whatever it is, it's tracking me and trailing me, but it's a little bit ahead of me now on the right side. So it's staying ahead of me, but I can hear it moving, but not, I can never see it because it's so dark. And this is like October weather, pretty cold. I had my jacket on and I'm just keeping pace down the middle of the road because that seemed to be the safest place than on either side. And I had to go up another incline, about a 50-foot incline again, on the other side of that um, flat area. So as I get to the top of that road, I can still hear it on my right. I got about another 50 or 100 yards to get to the, where the highway is. The highway is 
dead quiet too. Nothing going on that time of night. So I turn left when I get to the highway, and I can hear it behind this little drive-in cafe. I can hear it behind the post office, and there's lights back there, but it was so quick I could not see it move between them. I was watching, but I could not see it, but I could hear it on the gravel back there. So I had to go about probably about a quarter mile on the highway to where our restaurant was right on the main road. I lived behind the restaurant. My dad put a double wide trailer there and there was a huge barn behind the restaurant. And I lived in one third of that huge barn. We made an apartment out of it from, for me. So I get in there, I flip the lock over and I get in there and I throw about 15 shells into my 22 rifle. And I just, toss it back down on the bed. I said, this isn't going to do anything against this kind of creature. I don't know what to do. I'm thinking to myself, do I call the forest service, the park ranger? I don't know what to do. I'm like 15 years old, you know, and I've never heard of really a Bigfoot didn't really come to my mind. I knew there was some kind of huge creature out there, but I didn't want to wake up my dad. He's a Navy guy at three o'clock in the morning now with some kind of story about this or trying to explain to him what this creature was following me. So I didn't get any sleep that night. I just kind of listened to some records and stayed awake. First thing in the morning, as soon as it got light, 6.30 in the morning, I get out there and I hike back down there, down to that road. I go up, down the hill, up the hill, over by where those trees are, where I first heard it. And I walk right in. I go in about 25 feet, 30 feet into those trees and I see this big tree, and these are big pine trees. They're it's probably say three foot across center, you know, across the center of the tree, six inches deep and about six or seven inches wide, halfway around the tree, all the pine needles are cleared away. Now a dog would just dig, they wouldn't nice and neatly, you know uniform push these leaves or all the pine needles away from one side of the tree it just didn't make sense so i had an idea that you know maybe when it was later on i figured out that maybe when it was coming down the tree it was looking for the ground with its foot and trying to feel it that's the only thing i could figure that it was would have pushed the needles around the tree away i did notice a couple of trees had been pushed over in the area and it looked like possibly where the thumb, and this is about a foot, maybe a little more than that above my head at that time. And I was about 5'10 then. And you could see where the possibly like a thumbnail may have been pushed into the tree on the two spots where the two hands would be. And then this tree was bent, broken off and pushed over. And this tree wasn't dead yet. So... And it was probably about an eight or nine inch round tree. So that had me wondering. So I said, all right, I'm going to go down that hill where the tree line, where this creature would have went down to where the field is that I heard it to my left on the road. So I go down the road or I go down the woods and I'm walking along next to the barbed wire fence, about 20 feet out, kind of where I thought I would have heard it. All of a sudden, I see this mound of grass that the farmer had been dumping there. And it's probably about 20 yards, well, not 20 yards, 20, 25 feet long and about 8 or 10 feet wide. I see this footprint about 6 or 7 feet in, and it's the right foot of this creature. And it's sunk in about 8 inches deep and 9 inches deep into this grass. And you can tell it's the right foot. and about eight feet past that, both feet, left and right. And we figured out that it probably sank and said, oh, my God, what, is, you know, what, why am I sinking? And it landed on both feet. And you could see the definition of both feet, the toes, no shoes, obviously. This is, you know, a huge, the prints at that point looked around 21 inches long. There's some big ones out there. So I look in, up in the field and I look toward the corner and I see two big pine trees up in that corner of this. I'm still on this side of the road and this side of the road. 
So I go up toward those trees. I get about 30, 40 yards from them, and I'm looking up, and it's like, wait a minute. These are both pine trees, but one goes up about five or six feet, bends at a 90-degree angle, bends again straight up, bends back at a 90-degree angle, bends up again. It does this like two or three times on this pine tree. Now, I've seen where Indians have manipulated a tree, but never anything that did this three or four times on this tree. And I'm looking up there, and I can see something had been clawing, and there's fresh sap dripping from the top of this tree, the one that's all bent. The other tree next to it is 65 feet high, almost the same height as this tree, but perfectly straight on the road side of that, those two trees. So I'm 15 years old. I jump up there and I start climbing up. I climb up that tree. Now, Linda, I was on the last branch that would hold my weight, okay? Probably around a two-inch branch. And I'm about three feet away from reaching as high as that was digging the sap up there i don't know whether you they eat it use it for a sap for cuts i have no idea what they use the sap for but there was definitely and it wasn't like a sharp you know raccoon kind of claw it wasn't a little claw it was kind of like a fingernail kind of marks that was digging into the tree to get this sap out and it was flowing it was definitely flowing out and I'm looking, and it's like, what a perfect vantage point to be hidden by the other tree and watch cars or people going by. And that whole field had the perfect view of that whole field for hunting. And, you know, could have just, you know, signaled to the other Bigfoot and they would have just caught whatever was in the field. I don't know. But that was my first experience. And I started talking to a few of my friends and people around. I didn't tell my dad right away. And that was because I kind of got on a feeling that it was Bigfoot as soon as I talked to a couple of the Indian people around the area, Indian tribes. This is around the Navajo and Apache reservations. I lived on the Navajo reservation at two different times after that and had some experiences there, but not, not as much as this. So that was my first experience. Do you have any questions offhand quickly or? Well, um, other than the, the evidence that you saw after that and the vocals, though, that was pretty much well, all, you, all you had with that experience. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, the, the claw marks in the tree that was pushed down, the push mark halfway around the tree, which is, like I said, six inches deep and about six or seven inches wide halfway around the big tree and then the the mound that had the one footprint or the three footprints i guess you'd call it and then the bent tree with a sap claw that marks that was the first experience yes so from the the point where everything went silent and then the the growl the the noise began about how long was it before you got shelter into your apartment Oh, I'd say 15 minutes of it following and tracking me. So this thing was stalking you. Do you think there was more than one of them? Because it was on the left and the right both? I don't know. Because like I say, once once I heard it move to my left, and it, it was probably like, you know, where that mound was. So I know exactly where it was. It was about 20 to 25 feet from the barbed wire fence. And it's about six more feet to the road. So it's not that far away. And like I say, it was trying to move pretty quickly to get ahead of me, I think. And when it sunk down, it landed on both feet right away, right after that. So I heard that. And then I think it may have doubled back to get ahead of me on the right side. Or there was more than one. I don't know. At that point, I did not know. But... That same vocalization I heard about, this was October, so let's see, November, December, January, February, March. I think it was in March, down where those those two trees are, where the bent, bent tree and the other tree are, there was a dirt road right there. And on that road, 
On the left was where the farmer's field was. On the right, there was about five or six houses. My friend was renting the last house on the right, down that road. I went and visited him, and I stayed and met his new wife and was visiting their dog, Wolfie, you know, I don't know, an hour or so. I decided to go down to the lake from their house because it's not far from the end of that road. So I started walking out, and her dog, their dog was with me. So the dog was about 20 feet in front of me. I, we crossed over the cattle guard, and we're walking along. All of a sudden, I hear that same roar, and this is daytime now. Okay, I don't exactly remember what time it was. I would probably want to say four or five o'clock, but that's just a guesstimation. I hear the same roar and the dog stops in her tracks and she does a double take and looks back at me. And I just took off running toward it as fast as I could. And the Indians had taught us how to push off of rocks off of branches, use them as starting blocks, kind of as you run, just you can kind of gain speed as you're going and i'm running i'm looking side to side up in the trees as high as far as i can i get to the end of this tree line it's probably an eighth of a mile maybe a little more full out run and i'm out of breath and it's like the tree line ends it's about 50 60 yards away from the lake itself and i'm catching my breath i'm like okay okay so i decided to walk at an angle to the lake shore so i decide to go to my right first so i angle off like you were cutting off prey or something off at an angle i hit the shoreline i start walking the shoreline looking for any prints or any evidence and i'm still checking back in the trees to see if there's something along in those trees still that i may have missed don't see anything i get about 50 yards up and all of a sudden i see this mud well, I don't know what it is first. There's something sticking out of the ground. And it's sticking up about 15, 16 inches out of the ground, out of the level ground. And it's real close to the shore, but it's still like 60 or 70 yards away from me. So I'm walking, I'm walking, I'm walking. I'm getting closer and closer. And it looks like it's curling back toward the shore. And as I get closer, it is mud. And it's about an inch and a half thick pushed up out of the ground and then up about 14, 15 inches up. And then it curled back about four inches back toward the shore. When I got to it, it's a deep impression of the front half of this creature's foot. They have what's called a mid-tarsal break, which you may be familiar with. So their bend of their foot, I'm doing the opposite, but it bends in the middle, not like ours do with, with the toes. So I was looking at the half toe impressions of their foot, perfectly naked foot, no claw marks. There was, it was sunk down about eight and a half inches deep into this mud and pushed all that mud up the flat part of its foot straight up above ground and was curling back toward the shore this mud and their water was just starting to seep into the print linda i got this calm knowing feeling i wasn't scared i just got this calm knowing feeling of uh you know i, I know what it is you know i I, 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 there's no doubt, you know, and I turned, I took two steps and to this day, I don't remember what any other step. I don't remember walking out. I don't remember passing my friend's house. I don't remember that night at all. I never stopped at my friend's house. I didn't bring someone back out there. And this is the mid seventies. So we didn't have cell phones or that kind of technology. I think I may have had an Instamatic camera at home or I could have gotten one, but I had this knowing feeling that I didn't need to prove to anyone, you know? And I think that's probably what led me to be accepted by them because I didn't overreact. I didn't run. I mean, I ran toward it, <laughs> which Kind of crazy, but I'm kind of glad I did because I got the proof I needed at that point to know how heavy it was. I mean, 
it was nine, eight or nine inches deep and about as wide as, uh, I'd say nine inches wide, almost like a, a sheet of paper, you know, nine by 11. It kind of looked like that, except taper back a little more toward the back and then flat straight up, you know, above ground. And then it was curling back. Just, I, I want to do maybe a hypnosis therapy to try and do a regression to see what I may have blocked out or what's blocking my mind from recouping my walk out, in other words. Because we may have had an interaction. I, I don't know. That's something I want to find out. But you don't have any recollection of just being in deep thought about what just happened, maybe, or something like that, and just become no. minded about your walk out. You think it was just it was it's really a blocked period of time. Yeah. Two steps and gone. Nothing from and I remember every I explained every single detail to you. I remember every branch I looked up, every tree, everything. You know, every step I was running and taking the, I don't, after I passed the dog, I don't remember what happened to the dog. She was fine. <laughs> Cause people ask like the dog was fine. <laughs> she didn't get killed or anything. Two days later, I did go back to Johnny's and say hello and tell him about it a little bit, but I don't remember that dog that day though. So, so when you got, when, when you got, you went home, right? That's, that's where you went right after you left there, you went home. I must have. I mean, I remember the next day. I don't remember that day. Um, so your first memory is actually the next day after that happened? Yeah. And was it waking up in the morning or? Yes. And I'm so like. So you went through a fairly I long span of time. Yeah. And, then, and I don't remember. Obviously, I probably didn't have to work that night. Otherwise, I would have remembered that. But Or I went through work and never brought it up never crossed my mind which is kind of odd you know so what time of day and that's was only it? happened twice in my life that i haven't there's been time lapse like that exactly so what time of day was it when you actually was at the shore and you saw this initially i would say four o'clock afternoon four thirty, because it wasn't dark it was light it was sunny you know it was a bright day so, so maybe 16 hours, maybe or so that of uh, missing time. Um, well, as far as mentally memory, yes. Till the next day, seven, 7 a.m. Some day, apparently. Yeah. Right. And, and of course, a large part of that could have been sleep. So, um, right. that would be natural and normal not to remember what's happening around you during that period of time. But, um, so, so, but this calm feeling that came over you, um, have you ever experienced that before since? Yes, but not in relation that I know of to Bigfoot, but other things, but yeah. What do you think that was telling you other than you were on the right track and you knew exactly what you'd found? Uh, like I, I had nothing to fear. Like there was this loving, calm feeling. The only way I can describe it as. Mm -hmm. yeah. So from there, um, what did you do? Um, you know, did did you continue <laughs> to pursue uh, all the activity that was in that community? Yeah, I mean, we. Um, I talked to more um, tribal members. My friend Johnny had other stories that he had been told. Um, we talked to Grandma Penrod up in the area that had an experience as a child. She kept hearing this, what she was calling a, a cow. She thought she was hearing a cow. And I'm not sure if it was the same lake or not, but it probably was. Because it was the closest lake to where she lived. And as closest lake to where I lived. And a good enough size lake. She kept hearing it. So she walked down toward the lake. She got down there and she heard it again. She looked across the lake and there was this huge eight foot, nine foot creature kind of swaying its arms back and forth, just moaning. She said it had this sorrow moan in its voice. 
like maybe it was mourning a loved one that was in the lake or something had happened, but it was a sorrowy kind of a moan. Not, you know, that's why she kind of sounded like a cow to a little girl at first. But then when she could look, see it, and this is a pretty good sized lake, you know, you can't throw a rock across this lake. It's, you know, twice that distance, you know, what you could possibly throw across. And she, I don't remember her saying she ran, but I remember she said she just took off back home, you know. I don't know what she told her family or what, but she remember the sorrow in his voice was very that's the main thing that she wanted to get across to us so you know i've heard of that before i've heard that that same um expression used of the sadness of the sorrow that that was coming from a sound that one was making um any other reports in the the area or were you primarily the the most um conscious person that these things were there and and this was happening no there had been you know, hundreds of years of indian <laughs> stories passed down and totem poles and history of vocal accounts where the indians would be riding down a mountain on horseback and the bigfoot would be 50 or 100 yards to its side tracking right along with them down you know, without any problem keeping up with the horses and not in, it was more natural than anything else. They were just another animal and just, you know, you kept your distance, but respect their areas. Um, I had my friend take me to a cave once that he had something growl in his face. They found this cave by accident. They were going down to go fishing. And this is on Billy Creek. And Billy Creek is a, you know, a few, several miles long. And this is over by one of the lookout towers that are up there. And he went down there to go fishing. They found this big plateau. They brought this big corner curve on the, the river the creek. Call it a creek, but it's deep. It was probably about 60 feet down to where the creek is from the top. And as they were going down on this point part, Johnny actually slid down this rock into the cave. And I've been there since then, but he slid down this rock and goes, hey, tells his friend. His friend comes down and gets comes in the other the sideways, which is a little wider, about you know, as wide as a couch, plenty of room to get in that way. And they get down there and they have a big lighter. And there's this like two or three carcasses of birds and something little there, but this weird shelf, I call it a shelf. And it's almost like a, like a mattress would be against the wall, like 20 feet long, but it's got a flat edge that goes up about an eight or nine, 10 inches and then flattens out for about 20 inches toward the back of the wall. So it's kind of like a long buffet table or something. You know, you would look at it if it was higher, but it's only about eight inches, ten, nine inches up. But all along, you know, this one side of those cave. And there's, you know, it's not very tall. It's only about, I'd say, four feet tall in the cave. So we had to duck down. And we got our Bic lighters, and we're looking around. Well, when Johnny and his friend were in there, they were doing the same thing and they got toward the back of the cave and it's only about, I would say 24, 25 feet deep at this point. And something growled in Johnny's face. He ran over his friend on the way out. <laughs> okay. By the time his friend got out, he was white as a ghost and they just climbed back out. They left their fishing stuff and just ran for you know, out of there. So he brought me back there. This is like two years later when he brought me back to that cave. And just like he explained it, we went down. We could see where this slanted rock would could have slid down. We didn't because didn't want to get whatever. But we went down around it and then came in the bigger opening, went down into the cave. There were still some bird 
you know, traces there and some small animal bones. Not broken up as much as you would think by if it was a smaller animal. That dirt shelf, like I was talking about, all the way along that left side. As I got toward the back of the cave, there was this, I call it like an upside down pyramid type rock that was hanging down like about to the three foot level. So I had to go around this rock to get to the back of the cave. And all I had was a Bic lighter too. That's all we had. And I could hear and see this gap on the bottom of this flat um, wall in front of me. And it was like this huge cavern, Linda. You could hear the whistling just It sounded like Carlsbad Cavern that I had been to in California years ago. You could hear this huge amount of cavern behind this wall. So I know it continues. I couldn't move the wall, but someone else, someone, something else could, I'm sure. So that's still there, but nothing growled in my face, <laughs> luckily. <laughs> but I'd like to go back there and investigate more. But that's a huge plateau above that area. Um, and you, you know that there's huge caves up in Arizona and that's synonymous for, you know, lava tubes and volcanic, you know, area up there, the cinders from the volcanoes that's, you know, made these mountains. So these caverns are probably pretty big and could sustain quite easily many creatures. So that's an interesting area. Did, that was chance, actually. The, yeah, did you by ahead. any chance notice um, around the entrance of this cave if there was any evidence of any type of uh, Bigfoot activity? Um, not really, because there's a lot of rocks. You know, these are big boulders, big rocks, you know, from the 50 foot point above all the way down to where the creek is. Um, in the cave, there was dirt but there was no footprints at this point, at this time. Okay. Um, no, just an alarm, set that off. There, um, well, let me tell you about that, uh, that area while I'm here. One of my only visual sightings of Bigfoot was right near, near that area. Four of us, or four of us were in Johnny's car. He was driving, four-door Chevy Nova, I was in the back passenger side in the back. Two other gentlemen in the car were along those cinder roads along that same road. And Johnny has to use the bathroom. So he stops the car, grabs the toilet paper out of the glove box, heads out into the woods. Maybe a minute and a half, two minutes later, we hear sticks being broken. And they're not little, you know, twigs. This is no deer. This is something bigger. And Johnny yells, start the car. So I reach over. I take the car out of gear, grab the ignition, start the car without even pushing on the glass because I knew it would start. And it did. He jumps in and goes, there's something big coming. He takes off. And this is a six-cylinder Nova. Had some meaty tires because we always went out in the woods and the snow and whatever. So he's going along. 35, 40 miles an hour in these cinder roads. And I look back and there's something loping behind us. Not running, loping. And I, you know, you can't make it out. It's like 20 feet back from the vehicle, but it's keeping up with us, with us without any effort at all. I mean, it's like I say, loping. Not even not even a jog, just like a doom, 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 just like a loping. And he just kept going, going. And that was, you know, interesting because we know they're in that area. We know they're there. Johnny and I have camped out by ourselves in tents with my motorcycle and his car out in these woods dozens and dozens of times not really looking for bigfoot just we like to be out there and alone you know just cruising out be alone have our own time out there 
and we enjoyed this was, it. This was your only visual sighting. Give me some more detail about how this one looked. You know, color. Did you see the face? Did you just see it just moving? Um, how long it, did you get to observe it? It was probably about 20 seconds, and you could not see the face. Um, even when Johnny would put on the brake, there wasn't enough light to give off more than just the arms. And you could see like the motion. That's that's all I could see it was just the motion on the the creature. And you could tell it was big, you know, as wide as the car, it seemed. And just graceful, very graceful. I mean, the other kid looked back, too. He could see it, but we couldn't make it. You know, you couldn't tell any definition of face or other than the arms. You could see them flowing with its motion. Like I say, it was like a loping position to mm -hmm. us. Right. Well, since then, since since um, since you've had that visual sighting, have you had any other encounters? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, when I left Arizona, I went back to California and worked in my uh, mother's restaurant. My parents were divorced and separated. Where My dad had a restaurant in Arizona. She had one in California. So I worked with her for a few years. I spent a year in Oregon and along on the coast, right along the coast. Had a motorcycle. Didn't really think about Bigfoot. Well, he wasn't in my mind. I would ride up the river 20 miles, you know, spend the day, come back at night, you know. But Bigfoot Whirly really wasn't on my mind for quite a few years. We sold the restaurant in Oregon and moved, I moved to Connecticut. Where my sister was having her first child. Never been out to the East Coast ever. So I said, okay. So I left my motorcycle and station wagon in Arizona for my brother to sell. And I drove my Lincoln out to Connecticut. Got a job as a kitchen manager the next day at a restaurant, ground round restaurant. Like, okay, something, something to do. So I started, you know, thinking about it more, but it really wasn't on my mind. I met a girl, got married, had my boys five years apart. When they got to about 10 or 12, 10 and 15 years old, then I started going back into Bigfoot, looking and understanding a little bit more about it. And this is when I lived in Pennsylvania now. So I started going out and I'm finding signs like I did in Arizona. These small little teepee type structures where there's 15 or 20 sticks positioned around these little trees. And they're weaved in sideways along those upper ones. And that just doesn't happen. It's not, there's no way that fall from trees can happen that way. And especially when you find three or four in a two mile radius area. And then I see these breaks that are six or seven foot up on these trees. And they're, I'd say 80% of them were all broken off in the same direction. Now, at the time, and still to this day, you don't know whether they're facing toward where they're marking toward or the opposite direction they're marking to go toward or stay away from. There's a lot we don't know. The more you know, the more questions you have about these <laughs> elusive creatures. And I found an area, I was going camping with my brother um, I was coming from one area in Pennsylvania. He was coming from another. We were going to meet at this Hickory Run camping area. I was getting there probably about a half hour or more before him. And I'm driving my RAV4 along this side road going toward this campground. And I see this little trail. Like maybe a car has been down it a few times, a few years back, not even recently. So I stop and I back up. And I turned down this little dirt path. And it's like an old cul-de-sac where maybe truckers had been turned around years ago. Very muddy now. And I'm like, oh, okay, it doesn't really go anywhere. And I kind of look off to my right and I look like a couple of tracks still where a vehicle might have gone. 
like maybe to cut wood or something or just not nothing recently. So I pull my little RAV4 down there and I get past this big tree and all of a sudden I see this other tree that had been laid down and was part of a big four prong tree, four big, huge stems. One of those stems had fallen. And on the side of the one, this fallen part, still attached to the main part. So it's three and a half, four, about three and a half feet up off the ground where the prong, the four prongs are. There's probably 30 or 40 sticks weaved together on that side of the tree and a few on the other side, not many. And I'm like, okay. I stop and I get out of the vehicle and I walk over and I'm looking and there's hair all over the ground, like a 10 by 20 foot area of fur. And this is like early March. So it was like losing its winter fur, maybe malting or losing its fur, getting rid of this coat from winter coat. And most of it's like a reddish color hair, some kind of grayish ash color hair, but mainly this reddish color hair. And not long, you know, a couple inches, you know, most of it. And these huge plop of poop, feces. There was two plops. The one plop, there was a leaf as big as my hand. The small plop, was as big as that leaf and about two inches thick. The bigger plop was as big as a sheet of paper. If you know, 11 by nine piece of paper. And it was about three and a half inches thick, very gelatinous, a lot of hair fiber in there. Um, these laurel seeds were in there. Just, very unique for the, and huge. I mean, that's, and there's no, no cattle in that zone. Okay. And there's, it, you know, I've been around cows all my life. There's nothing resembled cow poo, cow pie from this. And I have pictures of this. I can share them with you. You can post them or whatever. That's fine. Um, so I went back to camp or met my brother brought him back there after we set up camp and he's, you know, he's in the jitsu black belt, you know, six degree, you know, he, he did not want to go down in these laurels with me to look for more evidence. Okay. But I did take that feces and box it up, bag it up, put it in the vehicle, take it back. There's, what can I say? I brought my friend, that I started investigating in Pennsylvania with his name is AJ Grubanowski. We started investigating that area quite a bit, you know, a lot of late nights and we'd hear different vocals, some wood knocks, but nothing, nothing definite, you know, you know, they're there because of the, the signs that we found where there's trees pushed over some trees weaved together those stick formations, TPA formations, I call them. So one night, I decided to bring three people with me. I brought AJ, Stephanie, and Stephanie's boyfriend with me during the day. And we got there around 2 o'clock, I think, 1.30, 2 o'clock in the day. And we hiked through these laurels. And these laurels are, the mountain laurels are thick here. They're like, I call them grandfather laurels. They're probably about 20 foot high and the leaves are about eight to nine inches long and about three inches wide, beautiful flowers on them when they bloom, but mainly a thick cover. The leaves stay green all year long. I've seen them with over a half inch of ice on these leaves and they're perfectly fine, perfectly green all winter long. They're there. So we're hiking down in these laurels for about an hour or so, maybe almost two hours. We're a good mile down there by the creek. And I said, guys, why don't we hike back up out of here? Let this area cool down. We'll come back later tonight. Let's hike over to some other area, drive to another area. 
So they all agreed. I let us back out because it's like I say, it's like a maze. You have to like either visually take mental pictures of these trees above the pine, above these laurels, or take pictures so you can find your way out. That's how easy it is to get lost in these. So we make our way back out to the vehicle. We drive for about 10 minutes, a few minutes to the another public area of hiking where there's a waterfall and some bridges. So we hike down there and we go off the beaten path down these like hoopty doops, I call them five and six foot mounds of dirt. We go down by the creek finally, eventually. And we find a spot that we can cross over onto this little island on the creek. The creek's only about 20, 25 feet wide at its widest point. So we're on this little island and we're walking along and I'm, I'm leading, I think, and we come across a footprint. There's a child-sized footprint, probably about seven inches long, human-shaped toes, human-shaped foot, and it's sunk down about just under an inch deep in this mud. Okay. AJ is the heaviest one. He's 235, 260 pounds, somewhere around there. After we took photographs, he steps next to that print and only went in about an eighth of an inch deep into the mud. So that kind of gave us the impression that this creature's child that stepped there was probably an estimated around 400 pounds at that size print. That's heavy or was carrying something heavy. There was only the one print. So we kept going. AJ took the lead then, and we had the two other people between us, and I was in the rear. About a few minutes later, we came across that same footprint going the same direction we had originally found the footprint. That doesn't happen to me. This was that second time where I had this time lapse happen. I, I told you. That's... We are going the same direction when we found the print the first time. We found it the same direction the second time. Like I say, AJ was leading this time, but we didn't go in a circle. This is a little tiny island on a creek. It doesn't happen. So I stopped everybody. I said, okay, stop. Follow me. We're heading back out this direction. I turned us back around and guided us back out all the way back up to the vehicle now it's almost dusk, getting dark. So we drive back over to the first area where all that hair was, where all those stick structures and the poop was originally to that area. And I decided to back in this time because it is muddy over there. And coming out at night, yeah, better off back in. So I backed in all the way back, all the way to where that same tree is, you know, where it's laying down. And we're just hanging out for about an hour or so, and I'm, you know, just talking and telling, you know, telling them about what's happened there in the past, what's going on. And I mentioned to Stephanie, I said, Stephanie, why don't you talk to them? Just say a few things. She's like, I don't know what to say. And I said, just say anything. Just kind of put them at ease. Tell them you're not here to hurt them. You're just here to, you know, visualize, talk, you know, interact with them if they want to interact with us. So she starts doing that. She starts saying a few things. So I, at the time, didn't have a flashlight. And there's kind of like two trails, one to the left where the trail goes down. And to the right is where kind of the water feeds down. So I went off toward the right where the water feeds down. And the other folks had flashlights, big spotlights and flashlights shining on my back. So it's shining up on these laurels, kind of looks like a huge Bigfoot, my impression, my shadow. So I'm like, oh, that's kind of neat. And I kind of rock a little bit, and I get about 30, 40 feet out there, and I'm doing what I told her to do. I'm just talking and trying to put Bigfoot at ease, you know, tell them I'm not here to hurt them. You know, we're just out here to, you know, say a few things. So I come back over to the vehicle, and AJ had gotten in the passenger's front seat. So he's in the front seat, and I didn't tell the other two or AJ, and I decided to replicate the roar that I heard in Arizona. 
I don't know why, just something told me to do it. So I turned toward the vehicle, and the other two are standing kind of on the driver's door area, a little bit in front of the vehicle. And my driver window was down, so I didn't want to yell near the window and blow his eardrums out or whatever. So I go to the back of the vehicle, right at the tailgate of the SUV, and I do it for like a half a second, just a really loud, louder than that, sorry. <laughs> but I got a, immediately something started stomping up at us. And it sounded like two trees, Linda, bipedal steps, gaining speed, breaking off branches, snapping off branches, coming right up at us. I mean, every impression was bam, 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 coming up at me directly, directly toward me. This boyfriend of Stephanie's jumps in the back seat, slams the door. She has to run around the front of the vehicle to get in the other side. Okay. By that time, I get in my side, start the vehicle. When she gets in, we take off. And they're yelling, don't stop. Go, go, go. That thing could just knock the vehicle over, knock the truck over. Go, go. You know, they're screaming at me, you know, and it's muddy. And I get through the mud and get out toward the road and we get on the road and we're heading out. And I want to go back. And they're like, no, no, no. I'm not going back tonight. No, no, no. So AJ and I decide, all right, we'll come back in the morning. So we come back first thing in the morning. And we find up in these laurels branches about two to three inches around, just tossed up into these laurels. Even this, and this is in 2019, no, 2018, when this first happened, when that happened. And even this, about you know, about a month ago, I took a couple of people out there, and those branches are still up in those laurels from that experience. And where the snaps are and the breaks are, just they were just tossed up into these laurels. And... It was the loudest steps I've ever heard in my life. And I've heard rhinos run by in the fields. I've heard buffalo. Elephants are very light on their feet. You know, they're very heavy, but they're very light. They're like, they're like dancing, you know, they're, they're not heavy. This was stomping. And I mean, stomping. We call it a bluff rush because it did stop. And later, I believe it may have been coming up to protect us. It wasn't a defense. Because of the way it stomped up at us, It, I don't know what I said and replicated when I did that yell at it, but it was directly aimed toward it, not knowing that, or that particular one, the Alpha or whatever was down there. Mother Alpha, it had to have been a big one. But when it stomped up at us, I mean, AJ could feel every step inside the vehicle. Every one of us could feel every step of this creature. And from like 60 yards away, 50, 40, 30, 20, it didn't stop. My goodness. Until we were driving it's away. Sounds like that was quite an experience. Um, you did say that it was somewhere in this ballpark that you had that that same kind of calm, that same feeling, and that you had missing time again. Is that right? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> when we found that footprint the second time, like I say, there had to have been something that put us back into that spot and kept going that direction because there's really no physical way. And we've been back to it that we could have got mixed up on that little Island and circled back around to come in that same direction of finding that footprint. It couldn't happen. <clears throat> so something, I don't know, warp time, you know, or sent us back in time and then we came across it again, but we weren't, we weren't leading the same direct, you know, I was leading the first time with the two guys in the middle of us, the girl and the guy and AJ behind. 
we we always liked it when we're going out we kind of protect the people in between you know i would rather be in the front or the back because i can hear things i'll even stay back 50 you know feet if i have to just to hear things better or i'll come up closer or same in the front you know we like to know what's coming up or what's coming from behind so for us to get mixed up and came across that same footprint in that same direction was very abnormal. More right. You had the concept that you were going, you were going forward and straight away from, or or th- following through um, in your directions. Island. No, no sense of, of of turning around or going back or circling at all. Right. And then all of a sudden, we come across that print again. And we know it's the same print because it was obvious it was it was and AJ's little his print was next to it. So it wasn't like we had never came across it. It was the same print. Exactly. So in, in your would... experience in your experience with these things, um, what do you think they are? Uh I, I've been asked that many times and this last few years, my philosophy now is that they're the alpha human. They are the alpha species of human beings. That's my belief. They've evolved differently. And um, the hair, I can explain in two ways. There was a Russian one, Bigfoot, that was caught and this is back in the 1800s, her name was Alma, I believe it was, that they named her, that they semi-tamed her to where she would do, you know, physical duties around the farms and help out and, you know, but she didn't like clothes, she didn't like, you know, there were certain things she wouldn't do and she would do, but she was semi-domesticated because of, of that. Well, some of the town's men bred with her, and as soon as the baby was born, she would take the child, run down to the river, and dunk the child into the river, and then bring it up and nurture it. And two of the children died because of the shock. But I think that was instinct and bred into the Bigfoot to stimulate the hair growth in them. And that's kind of how it would make sense. For a creature like us, that if that happened to us, we would stimulate our hair growth a lot. And that's kind of how that started, perhaps. Possibly so. It's hard to say. I hadn't heard that one before um, about the the tamed uh, Bigfoot. That's interesting. There was um, two or three of the, her children did live. And there's pictures of them. And they have a very thick, sagical crest. Their faces looked very Neanderthal type looking human. Um, I didn't have, don't have pictures of her, but I have pictures of them. And you could look it up, you know. I, I believe her name was Oma, Oma, but if you look up, you know, just Google or whatever, Russian, you know, Bigfoot children or, you know, lineage, there it comes up. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Um, so have you ever seen any of the um, the lights, the orbs, craft, or anything like that associated with this out, out, out in um, the wilderness areas? I, yes, we, um, this last year, we had um, our um, Pennsylvania Bigfoot Project has about 19,000 members, or, you know, over 19,000 now. And we have chapter leads in most of the counties in Pennsylvania. So these chapter leads will help people do investigations. They'll go out, they'll help people get over these trauma, traumatization or, you know, horrifying experiences, some with dogmen, some with Bigfoot, but we have a chapter lead campouts. So this was at one of our chapter lead campouts last year. And we were at an, undisclosed campground when we don't publicize where we're going to go we just let our chapter leads know and we book it and we go out and we camp 
well, two different nights, there was different light orbs that were seen. And some of them were very close to the camp area. Some of them were not. So there was like a, two different things with the orbs. And that was last year. Um, I also had an alien experience when I was very, very young. My brother was two year, is two years older than me. My sister is four years older than me. At this time, I was about three or four years, I would say three years old, because I know I wasn't that old. But we were in the Lake Tahoe area, my grandmother's house behind her restaurant. It was called the Forest Inn Restaurant in Lake Tahoe. Her house was behind it. They put us three kids to bed into this one same room, had a big picture window behind us, okay? I don't know how long we were in bed, but we started hearing this noise in the backyard or in behind this window. So all three of us jump up, and I'm the youngest, and I'm holding onto the windowsill like this, and I'm looking out, both hands, and we're looking out, and there's a spaceship probably 20 feet, 20 yards at the most out in the backyard. Three cylinder type pronged legs and a spaceship you know from the this is in the 60s mid 60s i was born in 61 so this would have been 64 maybe 65 at the latest and i remember some lights i don't remember any windows and then the noise had already stopped and we all just jump back in the bed after like looking for like 20 seconds, 30 seconds at it, jump back in the bed and covered our heads with the covers. We didn't mention anything to our parents the next day, the next week, the next month. It was probably six months later. I brought it up to my brother and sister and they remembered it I'm like, yeah, yeah, I do. I remember. And even this to this day, my brother and sister remember it. And it was strange that my parents I mean, may have known. I, I don't know. But maybe that had something into lightening up. You know, maybe I was in tune more to have the Bigfoot experiences. I'm not, a, you know, I'm 61 years old I, or 62. I don't care. I, I tell it like it is. That's what happened. <laughs> you know, I can describe it tell you exactly what it was i remember don't remember talking about it at all the next day the next week the next month five or six months later i started bringing it up to my sister and brother and they remembered it but we was never told a, our parents at that time still sure was this an isolated experience you never had another uh, experience with seeing any kind of a ufo or craft the only other one i ever saw was in arizona up in those mountains when I was walking through that area, I was talking about from my friend's house through the high school area. And I had looked up and I saw, and it had to have been an, an alien ship of some sort, fly about 40 million miles an hour and turn at an acute right angle and continue at that same speed. It, you know, and this is mid 70s at that time, there's no ship. To, to this day, they could do that and not destroy itself, you know, other than an alien craft. Right, exactly. Well, what else can you tell me? Um, we're about to see the end of the interview, but uh, if you have anything else you'd like to, to tell us, I'm happy to to listen. Um, I'll tell you about a, the dogman experience that was told to me by a woman I met just kind of out of the blue. There was like a kind of little shanty um, pop-up um, yard sale kind of thing where they had a lot of tie-dye and a lot of, you know, beads and crystals and things. And I'm like, and I was riding my electric bike. I have an electric bike with dual motors, front, rear, front and rear motors. So it'll do about 35 miles an hour, silent or pretty quiet anyway. I go out in the woods with it hopping over trees and everything. So I'm riding around and I decided to stop that day. So I stop and I park and I had one of my Bigfoot shirts on and it was like mm, hide and seek champ 
Champion 1967 and it had a big foot on the front. Bright yellow, black shirt. So the lady, one lady is like, oh, hey, I like your shirt. You know, I said, oh, so, you know, I said, hello. I told her, you know, I'm part of the Pennsylvania Bigfoot Project. And she's just like, she got this look on her face. Like, oh, my God, I got to tell you something. And she started telling me this and the emotion. Whew, sorry, I can feel it. <laughs> Gets to me. Um, she started telling me about a dog man experience that happened at her house. She was looking out her big picture window. And this creature was about 50 feet away and huge. And she explained it and it described it very similar to what we would consider a wolf man or a dog man, but wolf man. Um, I said, can you explain the ears? And she raised her hand like they were huge, you know, the ears. And she said it frightened her so much. She sold her house. And this is like seven months after when I talked to her, I mean, I talked to her about 45 minutes, you know, I said, I have to go have dinner. I will come back. I said, can I give you a hug to help calm you down? Gave her a hug. And said, you know, and I came back about an hour later and talked for another half hour just to calm her down, to get her through this. I said, even though it frightened you, you have to let it go. You have to forgive them for frightening you. You know, she said it looked pure evil was what she described this dog man as. This is in an area where we've had Bigfoot experiences. We've had little rocks tossed at us in this area. We've had vocalizations. We've heard monkey chatter, we call it, which is like big monkeys or baboons or not baboons, but not howler monkeys either. Just monkey chatter just going off just hoo, 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 like excitement and this is it's it's not in an area where there's any you know it's probably two miles from the nearest homes and it's deep into these woods there are creeks down below this is more of on the plateau where we had a lot of our experiences and it drops off probably 80 feet down into a ravine where the creek is. And this is toward the top where we heard a lot of these sounds and continue to have them. And we have parabolic microphones. You know, I'll take a, three or four people up there. And the new guy was like listening with the parabolic. And all of a sudden he hears these howls. And he goes, Glenn, Glenn. And I said, what? He said, you got to listen to this. I said, all right, keep the microphone in your hand. And I'll put the head, take the headphones off his head, put them on my ears. So he's still pointed in the same direction. I verified it. The sound would go up and then come back down. Go up and then come back down. And the third person, Adam, I said, Adam, come here, come here. You got to listen to this. He verified the same sounds. And this is probably about a half mile away at least. But we're up by one of these radio towers. And we could def definitely make out these vocals. The guy was, you know, an intern. He's never, you know, experienced anything. He goes, do you mind if I call my wife or text my wife? And I said, no, go ahead. You know, we don't have, to have anything to hide, you know, because he was so excited about hearing this for himself for the first time ever. And it's just a, a hot spot. This is um, an area they call... Su up Suskin Road, they call the Suskin Screamer. And this is, goes back decades that this sounds of the Screamer have been up there. People have seen Bigfoot on their quads. Um, vocalizations. We found uh, snowshoe rabbits impaled onto branches. And that was strange. Like two or three of these snowshoe rabbits impaled onto like four or five inch long broken off parts of these branches or and some of the innards were on these rock rock about 20 feet away it's just very bizarre stuff in this area um i have pictures of those too and you've talked to any hunters snowshoe rabbits are very 
rare. You know, you don't, you maybe see one, you don't, it's, to find two or three of them impaled onto these branches was very strange. Um, there's some underground springs that come up in that area. So there's water source year round, underground caverns that we believe. One of my, you know, I could tell you another story about Arizona that's kind of important. Around that time when I started finding more evidence after the second time I had heard Bigfoot, where I heard the scream and ran toward it. This is about four or five weeks later. I was drinking a bottle of wine with a girl, not my girlfriend, but drinking a bottle of wine, finished the bottle of wine. And I told her, I said, can you take the empty out? I want to go on the other side of the river. I never been on or this Creek, never been on the other side of this Creek that fed that Lake. Okay. And she looked at me and she goes, you're going out, you're looking for Bigfoot, aren't you? And I go, yeah. Cause I think I had told her or Johnny about, you know, different friends of mine. She goes, I have to tell you something right away before you go. And she goes, I don't care if you believe me. My family and I, we were driving our station wagon toward our house. We pulled in toward our driveway and we turn in and we saw a Bigfoot leaning its arm level on the top of our carport. Okay, most carports are about eight feet up. So its elbow leaning its arm sideways was leaning on the top of their carport. When it saw them, they stopped and it just turned and walked away. Didn't run, just walked. She goes, but that's not the only thing. Her and two other friends were walking through this marshy area. And this is probably a half a mile from where I had my first experience, but on the other side of the road from where I found the print, the three prints. This is on the other side of the road, about a half mile or more, maybe a mile in this marshy area. They came across a horse with its head ripped off. That was her exact words. And her face showed it. So I had no reason not to believe her. So I said, okay, I'm going to go on this side of the river. Think of the strength it takes to think of a deer. A human can't rip a deer's head off. A horse is... No, huge, the neck. I mean, the amount of, and the, it was probably 25 feet away from the horse. That's what she said. She said she didn't stick around to see if there was any parts missing or anything. They just ran and left. Um, so I decided to go on that side of the creek. Anyway, so I walked down the creek trying to look for a place to cross. This creek is deep. It's about 15, 20 feet deep or more in a lot of areas. And it's about 25 feet across. It's pretty, you know, substantial. This is the part that feeds the, the lake. I found a little levee about a foot and a half wide that probably had been built in the early 1900s that went across. So I walk across this little path or levee or whatever it is spillway or whatever i get across it i walk down the creek line on the other side i get about 100 yards maybe 150 yards down and i see a bob bar fence i'm like oh okay and i look up to my left and about 30 feet up is fresh breaks all three sticks the stick was broken in three places on the bob wire fence i'm like oh Okay. And I started looking and I can tell fresh breaks and they were fresh. And as I'm walking up, I see this clump of blonde hair and it's about six inches long and bigger around than one of my fingers and all blonde hair, you know? So if a human lost that much hair, <laughs> they'd have been screaming <laughs> or whatever whatever this was, but I'm looking, I'm about a foot and a half away and I'm staring at it. I'm looking at it and every hair on the back of my neck stands up. Every hair on my body started telling me, 
you're going to die. Something's going on. I, I, what I did, Linda, I did a 360 and dropped to my fingertips like Spider-Man. Okay. So I'm on my toes and fingertips, two inches from the ground, looking side to side up in the trees. And I'm still getting that feeling. I start slowly creeping back on my fingertips backwards. I get about five feet back and I slowly stand up. I slowly turn, walk out. I didn't lose any memory this time. I walked all the way out. I get back to that levee part and I'm walking across that and it's deep on my left side. I'm like, if there's something down there, it could just grab me and I would never be seen again. And I'm like, all right, I got to do it. Walk across it. I get back, I get back home. I call one of my friends. I said, you got to come out here in the morning because it was already getting dark. I said, you got to come out here in the morning. I got to show you something. I got to show you this hair that I found. So he goes, all right, all right, I'll be out there early. I'll be out there early. So he gets out there like 7 a.m. in the morning. We get out there, same area, walk across that little levee, walk down that 150 yards, go over to the barbed wire, walk up the barbed wire line, and the hair is gone, Linda gone wow and i'm freaking out i'm looking i'm looking i'm like the same distance away but i'm looking on the ground for prints for the hair any kind of the hair nothing it's every bit of it has gone off the bob wire and i'm just like oh my god this is so i know it It was watching me because that's how i got that feeling that it was watching me i know that it was watching me my friend goes over 10 or 15 feet away, and there's this rock that's kind of like a pyramid kind of shape, but it's more rounded, but it's probably about as big as a trash can lid, but it's, you know, like a volcano, you know, like concave or whatever. He tips it up. I have no idea why or why, why he was looking and why he would do that, but there's bob wire twisted up and shoved under that rock tell me an animal that can do that exactly a deer can't do it a bear can't do it you have to have hands to do that a human wouldn't do it the creek's 20 feet away you know if they're replacing a strand of bob wire throw it in the creek that's 30 feet deep no one's going to care you know they wouldn't to put it underneath a rock, that's just the only thing that makes sense in some of these circumstances is Bigfoot. Until you put Bigfoot in that equation, it just doesn't make sense. Well, that's true. Um, and, and there are so many of these incidences where something happens and the only way you can explain it um, is that the strong, strong, strong possibility that Bigfoot wasn't involved or invested in that for sure. Glenn, I'm going to have to end our interview today, but I really appreciate no all the wisdom and understanding that you have from, from a lifetime, basically, of experiences with this thing. Um, yeah. And and I appreciate your, your insight, your knowledge, and, and sharing that with us today. I'll let you know when this comes out, okay? Yeah, and if anyone wants to reach out, it's we're on Facebook, the Pennsylvania Bigfoot Project. You can always join our main group. I'm the, like I say, the assistant state director for pennsylvania but i also have my local county is lackawanna county that i'm the chapter lead of so i do 90 percent of my investigations through here but i travel to oklahoma i've been to montana this last year i've been you know i go around (laughs) (laughs) because there's people that need help 